The coming-of-age story is universal. Perhaps the most iconic of these Bildungsroman tales is that of a puppet who yearns to be a real boy. Am I a real boy? Written by 19th century Italian author Carlo Collodi, the original Adventures of Pinocchio is the most adapted children's story of all time, with three films released in 2022 alone. When can I leave to be on my own? The book has been translated to 300 languages, becoming a cultural touchstone in the 140 years since it was published, although Collodi never got the chance to see it translated to the screen. Whether the adaptation is cartoonish, couldn't have said it better myself, nightmarish, Bible. or even a little sleazy, what am I going to do now? Pinocchio is always a tale of adopting goodness, even though the definition of good varies from script to script. <laughs> Of the many iterations, Disney's iconic 1940 adaptation set the bar. It is a timeless classic, beautifully animated with cutting-edge techniques and characters who convey the full spectrum of human emotion. The cultural depictions, though, would not be approved by the Blue Fairy today. By Pinocchio! No! No! It features all the hallmarks from Disney's golden age. Cute animals, humor, and an Oscar-worthy soundtrack, but auteur filmmaker Guillermo del Toro flipped the script on previous iterations with his stop-motion adaptation that painstakingly brought a literal puppet to life. I wanted to make it about life and death, and it's during the rise of Mussolini. I like a puppets. One, two, three versions of the same story, each with a different take on what it means to be a real boy. So, without further ado, it's time to ask, What's the difference? Pinocchio! Across every adaptation of Pinocchio, there are two facts that remain consistent. Pinocchio wishes to become a real boy. I'm gonna be a real boy! And Pinocchio's nose grows when he lies. <laughs> every other bit of the original story is malleable, beginning with the story structure itself. Collodi's narrative structure is cyclical. Pinocchio gets himself in a bad situation, experiences a consequence, and is ultimately bailed out. This cycle repeats over and over until he finally learns the lessons that other characters repeatedly barked at him throughout the story. Through work, obedience, and selflessness, Pinocchio is warded with a new body of flesh and bone. How ridiculous I was when I was a puppet, and how glad I am that I have become a well-behaved boy! Disney's film has a more familiar, linear structure, wherein immoral villains tempt Pinocchio, propelling his journey from naive, susceptible child to conscientious adolescent as he learns from his mistakes. I'm going to the carnival! Del Toro's film remains a hero's journey, but is decidedly not about fitting any definition of goodness. Instead, it celebrates individuality over conformity. We all have to obey the law, whether we like it or not! Why? His journey is spurred on with attempts at becoming who everyone wants him to be, whether it's a star of the stage, a model soldier, or the perfect son. I will obey and go to school, and I will be the very, very best. Interestingly, Del Toro employs the cyclical structure of obedience from the book, but not by repeating lessons to an obstinate Pinocchio. Instead, this vicious cycle is represented through characters who find themselves stuck in patterns of oppression. Hey! Stop that! While Pinocchio dares to defy those in power, others obey like puppets. Who controls you, wooden boy? Who controls you? Through his defiance, Pinocchio inspires the film's other characters to change, a complete reversal from the book where Pinocchio learns from everyone else. Be exactly who you are. In the end, Pinocchio does not transform into a real boy because he was one all along. This movie is about finding yourself, says Del Toro, not just obeying the commandments that are given to you. I think we can and need to forgive each other and love each other for our imperfection. Collodi, on the other hand, thinks Pinocchio really needs to shape up. Before he was a puppet, Book Pinocchio was a sentient plank of wood who reveled in causing a ruckus. Collodi seems to convey that children seek instant gratification without empathy or regard to consequence. And when Geppetto scolds the puppet in public, he's arrested for abuse and Pinocchio makes merry. Like, like he's just, he's a bad boy. Del Toro captures the insatiable energy of Collodi's puppet, but removes all its mean-spiritedness. Even though Pinocchio lays waste to the house, throws fits, and disobeys his papa, he's kinder to Geppetto than his book counterpart. Good night, papa. Disney's Pinocchio goes beyond washing away the original's roguish qualities. He's sweet and doesn't grab Figaro's tail, which is basically unheard of in children. Where book Pinocchio starts out kicking and taunting his father, Disney's Pinocchio immediately loves Geppetto and wants to make him proud. He doesn't know anything, but he's intent on learning. 
Curiosity, however, killed the proverbial cat, which brings us to the dangers of the outside world, a concept most eloquently displayed by the way each Pinocchio interacts with fire as a means to communicate consequence. With his father in jail, Book Pinocchio is left alone to lead a vagabond life. He falls asleep hungry with his legs resting on a brazier full of burning embers, which by morning had burned away his feet. Throughout the book, it's Pinocchio's baser instincts that put him in harmful situations. Del Toro makes the setting itself a harmful situation. His iteration is set in fascist Italy. Rather than a lesson on good behavior, Del Toro uses fire to highlight the dangers of blind obedience. Hey, try to get closer to the fire, to get warm. As Pinocchio naively puts himself at risk at Candlewick's behest, he truly believes it is for his own benefit, and even becomes upset when he's saved by Geppetto. Aww. Papa, you ruined the nice light on my feet. In this way, Del Toro illustrates that unquestioned obedience can delude one into acting against their own self-interest. Sign here, here, and here. Del Toro's theme of authoritarianism carries over to the antagonists as well. While the villainous showman and swindling Honest John learn some humility in the book, Disney depicts them as one-dimensional characters who are all bad and never get their comeuppance. Quiet! Shut him up! Yes, then you haven't heard of the easy road to success. Del Toro combines the two baddies into the singular and scrupulous Count Volpe. I am the puppeteer. You are the puppet. Under his control is Spasatura, an adaptation of Gideon the Cat, a mostly silent sidekick in both the book and Disney adaptations. Spazzatura must overcome the toxic power dynamic between himself and Volpe in order to snuff out the dangerous flames of control. Ha! Give me that! You man, G8! Disney's film, however, doesn't use fire as a lesson on laziness, as in the book, nor is there any anti-authoritarian message, like in Del Toro's version. Instead, Pinocchio indulges in temptation to touch the flame. Temptations? Yep, temptations. They're the wrong things that seem right at the time. Even with his finger alight, Pinocchio still doesn't understand the danger of it. All he knows is that it's interesting and he wants more. The wide-eyed curiosity makes him a target for opportunistic ne'er-do-wells like Honest John and Gideon. They use the power of temptation to sell Pinocchio not one, but two times. First to Stromboli the Puppet Master, and then to the terrifying Carnival Barker. Boys! <laughs> Fortunately, these stories also feature empathy and goodness, usually embodied by the parental figures, Geppetto and the Blue Fairy. The traditional depiction of the Blue Fairy is one we've seen time and time again, a woman with wings, a wand, and a penchant for offering hope to unfortunate souls. In Disney's Pinocchio, the Blue Fairy is summoned from the stars to grant Geppetto's wish for the son he never had. Wake. The gift of life is thine. Clodius Pinocchio crosses paths with the fairy while she's minding her own business in her house in the woods. A child at first, she rapidly ages throughout the story until she becomes a mother figure, teaching lessons and bailing Pinocchio out of the situations he brings upon himself over and over and over again. Del Toro's adaptation steers away from the classic fairy tale approach, leaning heavily into folklore. His blue fairy is split into a pair of sisters. Sister one is death. She is tasked with teaching Pinocchio life lessons. You never know how long you have with someone. Death is the mother of Pinocchio. Sister Two is a wood sprite who is drawn to the mortal plane by Geppetto's anguish over the death of his son Carlo. Why won't you listen to my prayers? I'll make Carlo again. Neither the book nor the Disney adaptation give Geppetto this backstory, nor do they tackle the subject of grief, but here it drives Pinocchio's construction. Del Toro pays homage to Frankenstein as Geppetto's rage plays out as a macabre fit of violent creation. The wood sprite's magic acts as the final electric shock which brings the creature to life. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Good morning, Papa! You're not my son! Another major shift from previous incarnations is Del Toro's handling of parenthood. This movie says, can, he, can Geppetto learn to be a father as opposed to Pinocchio learn to be a good boy? Del Toro utilizes the image of Jesus, who famously had to live up to expectations of biblical proportions. He's oh, a puppet, just a puppet! No, I'm not! Del Toro turns a critical eye to the standards by which parents measure their children, which could conflict with the child's identity. I made you to be like Carlo. Why can't you be more like Carlo? Because I'm not Carlo. 
I don't want to be like Carlo. Carlo is... Enough! You are such a burden. Both Disney and Collodi depict a glossier version of parents as all good and all knowing. To obey and honor them is right and good. Meanwhile, Del Toro's parents create conditions for their love and approval. This abnormal boy lacks discipline. Young Candlewick, whose name implies a thin and fragile nature, tries to live up to his father's definition of an ideal son. I'll show him I'm no coward. I'll make him like me. Inspired by his friendship with Pinocchio, Candlewick eventually takes a stand against his father. I'm not afraid to say no. He refuses to idolize war during their stay at a fascist youth camp, which Del Toro substitutes for Pleasure Island. Right here, boys, right here. Get your cake, pie, little pickles, and ice cream. Eat all you can. Be a glutton. Stuff yourselves. It's all free, boys. It's all free. In Disney's film, he and his new friend Lampwick indulge in every taboo a good boy shouldn't do until they make complete jackasses of themselves. Rick Baker, eat your heart out. In the book, Pinocchio is but one school day away from earning his mortal body when his best friend Candlewick convinces him to abscond to the land of boobies. Disney mirrors the source material's events up until the horrifying mutation. Rather than growing a simple donkey tail and ears, book Pinocchio becomes a full-fledged beast of burden, sold into a circus where he breaks his leg and is tossed into the ocean to drown. Boys mustn't keep mischievous companions, for they will land you in trouble. But of course the blue fairy turns him back into a puppet so he can keep not learning his lesson. Say, how do you know the difference between right and wrong anyway? Which lessons should we obey and which should we rebel against? Why, listen to the insect living inside you, of course. Even though the right things may seem wrong sometimes, uh, sometimes the, the wrong things <laughs> may be right at the wrong time, or uh, vice versa. <laughs> The Talking Cricket acts as an advisor across all the iterations of Pinocchio, but under different circumstances. Disney's Jiminy Cricket acts as Pinocchio's conscience, who travels alongside the puppet to remind him of the rules he's meant to follow. After nearly abandoning Pinocchio on a few occasions, he earns the fairy's blessing after sticking by Pinocchio's side when it mattered most. My, my. The talking cricket in the book, however, embodies the lesson that good boys listen to those who know better. Unfortunately, it's not a lesson that Pinocchio can internalize at that moment, so he smashes the cricket with a hammer. The bug returns as a ghost, and later, inexplicably, as a physician and a brand new homeowner. Del Toro playfully alludes to the book's insect with physical gags that threaten to kill Sebastian J. Cricket, who acts not as Pinocchio's conscience, but as his heart. Rather than Disney's moralistic drifter, Del Toro's Cricket is an ambitious writer with dreams of his own. I could write my memoirs, and what a tale it would be. Though he doles out hard truths to both Pinocchio and Geppetto, he must overcome his own self-aggrandizing to be a better person. Cricket, the person. Pinocchio taught me that. I mean, I taught it to him, and then he taught it straight back at me. By the end of the journey in all three versions, Pinocchio rescues Geppetto from a monstrous sea creature, with each rescue story culminating in a unique lesson on mortality. In the book, Geppetto is left infirm after years spent inside the dogfish and the blue fairy falls ill in old age. The wooden boy finally does right by his parents and gets a job, earning enough money to care for them in their twilight years. Boys who minister tenderly to their parents are deserving of great praise and affection. Disney's Pinocchio features the more traditional storybook act of self-sacrifice. Pinocchio! Disney's film also values bravery, honesty, and selflessness over a good work ethic. Notably, child labor laws were enacted in the U.S. just two years before the Disney film's release. Little wooden boy made of pine. Del Toro's Pinocchio remains a wooden boy, but he does courageously sacrifice his immortality to rescue his father. My boy. Inspired by Pinocchio's selfless example, Sebastian uses his reward to bring the puppet back to life a family restored with love and acceptance. In the film's denouement, we see Pinocchio outlive each of his family members. The audience is left with the feeling that it is the impermanence of life that makes it so special. What happens, happens. And then, we are gone. When all is said and done, Collodi's book considers the default human condition to be selfish, obstinate, and destructive. Obedience places the children on the path to love and safety. Disney, on the other hand, seems to think children are inherently good, if not naive and easily tempted. Disney warns children not to fall prey to false promises. Listen to your conscience, which will guide you onto the path of morality. Prove yourself brave, truthful, and unselfish, 
and someday you will be a real boy. Del Toro has the most celebratory approach to the human condition, which is that everyone is uniquely curious, excitable, and worthy of love. When navigating a world that wants to tell you who you are and what to do, one must be true to oneself. All these forces crack you when you're a kid, and then you spend the rest of your life figuring out how to mend. I don't want to be a burden. That's it for this episode, but let us know what you think of Pinocchio in the comments, and be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more What's the Difference?